Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. War, spiking energy and food prices, threats of famine, new waves of refugees and migrants, crashing markets, recession, and those are just today's headlines. It's become a complicated, nasty, dangerous world. But all of that is, at least in a sense, old news. What is new is this, and I quote, for the first time in human history, we face a planetary emergency. Human pressures on Earth have reached dangerously high levels, and humanity may no longer be able to count on the biosphere to continue dampening greenhouse gas emissions and hold on to its carbon stocks. Those words were written last year by Johan Rockström, who is our guest today. We'll discuss in a few moments what they mean. None of it is good. Uh, But you should know that Johan is widely recognized as one of the leading scientists working on climate and sustainability issues and is a longtime friend of the Telberg Foundation. Welcome, Johan, to New Thinking for New World. Yeah, hello, Alan, and and great to be with you. Johan, we met, I think, at Telberg in Sweden in around 2008 when you were working on the planetary boundaries concept, which we're going to come to in, in a few seconds. At that time, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere were somewhere around 380 parts per million, I think. Today, we're at 420 parts per million, and I suspect tomorrow we're going to be higher than that, which, as you wrote in the piece that I quoted, seems to be moving towards exhausting the planet's natural equilibrating systems. So let me start with a layman's question. Um, I conclude from that piece and others that you've published recently is that we're getting pretty close to game over. How worried should we really be? Yeah, thanks. No, we should definitely be very worried. And um, I can tell you it doesn't come easy for the scientific community because it's not only me personally, it's actually an international group of scientists coming to the conclusion that we have to declare a planetary emergency. And when you think carefully, what, what is an emergency? Well, an emergency is something that occurs when we have a catastrophic risk, something that we cannot accept, like uh, your house burning down or, or losing a family member, multiplied by time, meaning that we're running out of time. So the emergency is a combination of an unacceptable risk uh, and when the window of, of, of solution is running out. And for 30 years, science has actually been showing that we face risks of catastrophic outcomes. So the first parameter in that emergency equation has actually been quite well established for for decades, that if we push the climate system and the Earth system too far, we risk irreversible changes that could undermine uh, life support, the livability on planet Earth for humanity. What's special now is that we're running out of time that we have just one decade, or actually now only eight more years, to cut global emissions by half, bend the global curves on all the planetary boundaries, and decisively start moving in a new direction, because we're coming very close to tipping points. Tipping points meaning that if you cross those thresholds, the Earth system will not kind of collapse overnight, but it will start drifting in an unstoppable way, towards less and less and less livable conditions for humanity. That's what is the fear, that we press the on button on unstoppable change. That is what makes it an emergency. And, and you're absolutely right that when, when we met the first time uh, working on the planetary boundary science, we put the climate planetary boundary at 350 ppm. That's, that's actually significantly higher than the 280 ppm, which is the pre-industrial level of concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the the dominating greenhouse gas, the one that provides 70% of the global warming we are experiencing today. It's it's significantly outside of the pre-industrial level of 280 ppm, but we consider that the Earth system, the planet has a has a you know significant degree of resilience to buffer up to a certain point. So we put the boundary at 350, 
But we are now even outside of that point, which gives us very high scientific confidence that we are really putting the Earth system stability at risk. But we're still not uh, seeing that we have ultimately crossed the, the, let's say, the escarpment point. But we are having more and more scientific evidence that we are very close. So yes, the, the answer is it's a true emergency. Uh, we have to turn this around very, very rapidly. And, and we cannot exclude basically crossing that, that um, irreversible line at any moment. And what is it that will determine when we cross that point? Well, it will be determined by, by the resilience and buffering capacity of the system. And that has to do with the other planetary boundaries. So how much uh, carbon dioxide uptake capacity will we continue to be able to rely on in oceans, in biosphere, on land, uh, from other greenhouse gases. So it's all about the, the coupling of the entire system, and we might, might come back to that. So, so the carbon dioxide levels um, cannot be looked upon in isolation and say, okay, are we at 420? Oh, so that's too late. Or we are at 380. Oh, we can still consider ourselves beyond the safe side. Oh, no. The, the, the translation of how risky 420 ppm is, our current level, depends on the state of the other living systems on Earth. And, and this is what we have to recognize. That, that's why we need to have this, this full planetary approach to avoid catastrophic risks. Let's come back to that in just a second. Uh, but to, make, to undermine the point you just made about how long we have known what we know, I came across a report of a, a memo written in 1977 uh, by President Carter uh, climate scientist. He was actually his scientific advisor. And in that memo, he tried to get the president to recognize that there had, that greenhouse gases were rising exponentially uh, and would likely accelerate, that the greenhouse effect could lead to global warming of up to five degrees eventually. Um, and he was worried that the consequences could, and I quote, spiral out of control, unquote. That's 45 years ago. Um, yet we are where we are because of your work and, and the work of others. We know lots more about what's going on. Um, so the knowledge side of this equation has progressed really quite nicely over the course of the last three, four, five decades. Um, but the action side hasn't kept a pace. Why has the gap, I would argue, gotten even wider between what we know and what we're doing? Yeah, I mean, to begin with, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is this is one of the most mature science areas in natural science we have. I mean, I mean, it's it's Svantarenius in the end of the 19th century who postulates anthropogenic emissions of carbon dioxide will raise temperatures on Earth. So you're absolutely right. I mean, we have such an enormous evidence base that we're standing on, and still we're not acting. So so why is that? Well, this is, of course, um, the big question and the big frustration we're facing. I mean, there are many, many elements to to answer, to attempt to answer that question. One is is obvious, which is the fact that uh, behind global warming is is energy, and energy provision is what runs the global economy. So this is not an environmental issue. It's not a single factor. This is the whole um, global world economy as we know it that has to be reconfigured. It has to be fundamentally re recalibrated into a completely new logic, which is to move from fossil fuel burning, driving the economy, to uh, zero carbon renewable energy systems running the economy. So that is that is one, one reason why this is a, a challenging transition. It's not, it's not as simple as when we... Uh, were about to 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 destroy the living conditions on Earth when we transgressed another of the planetary boundaries, namely uh, depleting the stratospheric ozone layer. And we listened to science, and and industry stepped up and innovated and could launch a whole new series of of uh, ozone or freon free uh, chemicals that were not depleting the stratospheric ozone layer. Here we're we're now facing a more systemic challenge. Of, of redesigning our, our entire 
society. So that, that's kind of number one. And there's so strong vested interest to maintain status quo. Number two is is something that is is has been plaguing and, and, and haunting us all along, which is that the climate system is so sensitive that it's actually just a small minority of us on Earth that have caused all the damage so far. It's the rich minority. It's the industrialized countries in the world through 150 years of burning of fossil fuels that, that has been able to cause all the damage and take us to a point today, already today, at 1.2 degrees Celsius of global mean temperature rise, which is more than uh, more than 200 percent, I mean more than twice, outside of the warmest temperature on Earth since we left the last ice age. So for 12,000 years, when we've been developing civilization as we know it, we've had a global mean temperature of plus minus a half degree. So just 0.5 degrees Celsius away from the pre-industrial average temperature of 14 degrees Celsius. And today we are at 1.2. So, so this has been caused by the rich minority. And, but the vast, vast majority in the world have, have contributed very little. But they are uh, on, on very rapid trajectories of, of rising out of poverty. We're talking about India. We're talking about Indonesia, Nigeria, South Africa. China is, of course, well advanced already. Now, these are economies that, to a large extent, are powering their journey towards, uh, towards better uh, economic development through coal, particularly coal, but also oil and natural gas. And these are normally state-owned resources. So basically, they are not priced. They are, um, you know, a very subsidized source of rapid access to energy, which can lift economies rapidly out of, of a poor state. So that is also, of course, a dilemma that as long as we don't have a way of compensating for that, as long as we don't have a massive way of helping developing countries through finances, I mean, it's quite pathetic. I mean, it's nothing less than pathetic that here we've been fighting for years in the climate negotiations to fill up the global climate fund with 100 billion US dollars to help developing countries in investing in, in the future that will save us from climate disaster. 100 billion US dollars. We're not even able to fill up that fund. We're not even able to agree. In the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, 15 trillion US dollars were put on the table for COVID recovery. 15 trillion, 15,000 billion US dollars were put on the table. We just compare that to us not being able to solve the climate crisis with 100 billion when we put 15,000 billion for, for COVID recovery. It just shows that the world is not willing to put the finances behind the transition. And the finances has to largely be about raising the, 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 the more vulnerable economies in the world to, to move directly to a safe zero carbon path. So that, that's a second uh, fundamental reason why we're not able to, uh, to rise in this, in this uh, situation. And then a, th a third, just I've mentioned it, is of course our, our economic model's inability to factor in and value the future. Uh, future generations are rising because they recognize that we are unable to value their future. We're simply shoving the responsibility to clean up the climate damage to our children. And this is, of course, re represented, for example, in, in our market-based discount rates, which makes any investment that gives us a livable future in 20 years' time basically zero value today at market value. And this is, of course, a, a, a perverse um, failure which which also explains why we are unable to really really translate the the scientific urgency into scientific action let's talk about the money for a second because we have more or less emerged from the pandemic uh, or at least we've forgotten about the pandemic to focus on other issues uh, depending on how you look at this but as you said the major industrial countries plus china and others spent beyond a king's ransom uh, to soften the impact of the pandemic. Uh, there was great hope. I remember in this podcast series talking a couple years ago to Christiana Figueres, who was hopeful that that money could be greened, if you will, uh, and that it would be an inflection point to build a global economy, or at least a European and American economies that uh, were coherent with the needs of the planet. We didn't do that. Something like 2% of the American investment and less than 15% of the European investment 
um, by any stretch of the imagination is green uh, of the pandemic monies. Uh, I conclude from that that the politics aren't there and they're not going to be there if we don't have a crisis that is so urgent and immediate and evident and obvious that politicians won't have a choice but to do the right thing. Is that, and again, you're a scientist, and I apologize for asking the question, but you've spent decades trying to persuade people to look at the facts. Uh, we just had an opportunity to turn those facts in, to use those facts to produce a different world. We blew it. What do you conclude from that? Well, to, to begin with, I agree with you. We, we blew it, and it's a huge disappointment. It, it was, a, was a massive missed opportunity, and it's a double missed opportunity because not only was the money on the table, moreover, this is perhaps the first time uh, you know, in living generation where the entire world, all citizens on Earth, recognized that we were all interconnected into one systemic crisis. COVID-19 is a failure in one spot of the planet that propelled itself across the entire world, affecting us all. And that's exactly what climate change is about, that it doesn't matter where things spill out into the atmosphere, it hits us all. So I'm, I'm really disappointed that this was not the moment of deep insight of how we need to reconnect to planet Earth and, and, and govern the system together uh, collectively. I, 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 I must say that that is a, a big disappointment. The rebound is, is, is complete as, as things are today. I mean, rebound to a pre, pre-pandemic world where we have learned nothing. What do we need then? Well, of course, we cannot exclude, unfortunately, that you're right, Alan, that, that we may have to have a few more you know, extreme events like, like heat waves and like the British Columbia uh, burning down of Lytton last year after 49.6 degrees Celsius of devastating heat wave that that uh, so so devastatingly hit the local community or the floods in in Germany where I am now last summer you, you cannot exclude and, and and of course the vulnerable countries in the world are hit by this much more frequently and much more severely I I I work though I mean in, in my work I mean I should say that the Potsdam Institute we lead something called EZMIP the the large IPCC assessment of climate impacts across the world. So we're kind of continuously monitoring what's happening with climate change impacting communities across the world. I still believe that we that we cannot operate against that being our only final uh, pathway to, to, to action. There has to be uh, preemptive efforts uh, as much as we ever can. And the reason for this, of course, is scientifically we know, unfortunately, that the moment the really big impacts occur, it's very likely too late. Uh, I mean, when, when if, if we start having, you know, irreversible, uh, accelerated melting of the Greenland ice sheet and a further slowdown of the Gulf Stream, you know, the moment the, the people in the world wake up to that kind of devastating catastrophe, it it's too late to turn things around because it's a tipping point. So we need to have preemptive action. And and what is that preemptive action? Well, I think it, it can only be that today, I mean, if you want to look very pragmatically at, at the situation today, I think it's about establishing climate clubs or, or, or alliances of, of countries, economies, uh, sectors willing to move faster. And, and the reason why that can work is simply that we have, as you know, so much evidence that once you have invested and once we move towards the, the fossil fuel-free zero-carbon solutions, we know we will get more jobs and better health and better competitiveness and more resilience coming out of it. And in the Ukraine war, we have even more support for that, that if you want to build peace and more resilient societies, you, you better go zero carbon because you don't want to sit in the in the in the knees of, of autocratic totalitarian states controlling your gas or oil and coal. So there's something here that has to happen preemptively as well. We cannot wait for the for the climate induced disasters to to just fall down on on our societies. If you feel that the world lacks global leaders, please help support the Talberg Foundation programs. Individual donations are being accepted at 
talbergfoundation.org slash donate. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org slash donate. You've mentioned again tipping points. So let's use that as a segue to the planetary boundaries discussion. Uh, The great genius of planetary boundaries, of course, was to point out that it's a whole earth it's a whole planetary system, and there's a variety of pieces to that system. They interact, good, bad, and ugly, they interact, but they need to be understood in detail in each of them. Um, my memory, but my memory is getting a little faulty these days, is that there were nine spaces in that planetary boundary discussion. But maybe you could walk us, what, what do we know today about the boundaries? Uh, where are we vis-a-vis uh, the boundaries that you and other scientists have have articulated as being uh, critical to this to the maintenance of the kind of life on earth that mankind has become used to and expects and wants yeah so so the planetary boundary framework has now been become established i would argue as as almost mainstream in 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 understanding what is required for us to navigate our future in the anthropocene the anthropocene being the geological epoch, epoch we've now reached where we are now the dominating force of change on the entire planet and just as you say the this this uh, anthropocene epoch is reached exactly at the same time when we now have scientific proof that the whole planet is is a self-regulating single system it's a it's a complex self-regulating system which has interactions feedbacks and tipping points so if you want to stay in a desired livable state of the planet you must take care of the entire system in 2009 we published the first planetary boundary science framework launch and uh, identifying nine planetary boundary systems the question we asked is the following what are the biophysical systems and processes that science shows regulates the state of the earth system and can we for those nine uh, well we scanned off all the science and out came nine and can we for those systems quantify control variables for each one of them and define a safe operating space beyond which those quantifications we risk crossing tipping points and causing you know, drift away from livable conditions, but within which we have a very high chance of remaining in, in a Holocene-like stable state of the planet that can support humanity. The nine systems will come as no surprise, actually, to, to most of us. And that's my experience when talking about this to business leaders or, or students or citizens in general. Three of them are those that have scientific evidence of being perfectly mixed at the planetary scale and that have planetary scale tipping points. And of course, one of them is the climate system. A stable climate system is a prerequisite for humanity's livability on Earth. The stratospheric ozone layer is a second one, the protective ozone layer in the stratosphere against dangerous UV radiation. And the third one is a stable ocean, the thermostat of the whole planet, and we use ocean acidification as, as our thermometer, our control variable for, for the health of the ocean, the ability of the ocean to absorb energy, to be a chemical cycle function, to, to regulate the, the livability on Earth. Then you have four biosphere boundaries that are not having proof of planetary scale tipping points, but we know that they regulate the resilience of the whole system, the absorption capacity of carbon, the ability to cycle elements, uh, the the generation of rainfall, uh, oxygen levels on Earth. And these four are biodiversity, so basically all the living species on Earth. Secondly, it's the configuration of land. How much temperate forest, boreal forest, tropical forest, uh, wetlands, uh, uh, grasslands, peatlands do you need on Earth? The, the composition we've had since we left the last ice age, land system change. And then you have... You know, you have a water cycle, you have a carbon cycle, but you have also biogeochemical cycles. And the two big ones is nitrogen and phosphorus. So we call these the biogeochemical cycles, but for simplicity, it's nutrients. It's nitrogen and phosphorus cycles. And then the the fourth one is, of course, the bloodstream of the whole Earth system, the hydrological cycle. So water, nitrogen, phosphorus, nutrients, land, and biodiversity are the biosphere, the four biosphere boundaries. These are the ones that that regulates the the ability of the Earth system to take disturbances. So we load greenhouse gases, 
but the living biosphere absorbs 50% of those greenhouse gases from fossil fuel burning, thanks to the resilience on living natural ecosystems on land and, and the ocean. And then you have two remaining boundaries, which you could call the aliens, because they have nothing to do with your system. They've never been around before. They're created by us humans, entirely by us humans. And number one is, is chemicals. We call these novel entities. This is everything from microplastics, uh, nuclear waste, uh, organic pollutants, uh, endocrine disruptors. The cocktail of, of uh, chemical compounds that we are loading into the Earth system with risk of, of changing the genetic composition of species, including our own. And, and the final, the ninth boundary, is aerosol loading. So this is the loading of all the air pollutants, like smog. Think of smog in the cities, that we have so much evidence today that it uh, changes the position of the monsoon systems. It, it regulates the energy exchange on planet Earth. It's like a, like a mini climate system uh, factor. And, and it both cools and warms. It's a very complicated one. It has massive health impacts as well. So there you have the nine. And um, in 2009, we um, were not able to quantify all of them, but we estimated that three of the nine were outside of the safe operating space, climate, nitrogen, and biodiversity. In 2015, we did the second scientific update. We could quantify uh, six of the nine. We were still lacking quantifications for air pollutants, novel entities, and, and uh, aerosol loading. But we estimated that four of the nine were outside of the safe space. We added at the time uh, both phosphorus, but also land system change, cutting down too much natural ecosystems, particularly rainforest and temperate forest on Earth. Now, as we speak, we are two weeks away from submitting the third scientific update. We're now having a breakthrough because we're quantifying all the nine boundaries. It's, it's fantastic. It's based on, on scientists around the world who have been scrutinizing and advancing the planetary boundary science. So we have a, a green and blue water boundary paper update that has been done and a novel entities quantification and also on aerosol loading. And I can share with you a bit preemptively that, not surprisingly though, then unfortunately, our assessment will be that we've gone from four to six boundaries being outside of the safe space. So we're adding both fresh water, that we're pushing the, the freshwater consumptive use, both of green water, meaning soil moisture, and blue water, the river water and rivers, too far. And that we're also outside of the safe space unloading chemicals in the earth system, which we could not quantify before. And, and the other ones that are outside of the safe space are continuing deeper into the red. So they're going higher and higher in, in high-risk zone. So unfortunately, the conclusion is that when we need a resilient planet more than ever because of climate forcing, when you want a planet that is in a healthy state to buffer the pressures of climate change, we are unfortunately shooting ourselves in the foot by, by ourselves undermining that resilience. So, so that is the drama with the planetary boundary assessment today, that, that the planet is in, a weakest, in its weakest point, as far as we can see over the last 12,000 years, when we need her to be in the strongest position. And, and this is, of course, what combines into, into our scientific worry that the emergency is much more than only carbon dioxide. It's really about bending all the curves because we so rapidly need a healthy planet to cope with unavoidable pressures that we have subjected through the global warming uh, pressures we are we're causing. So that's where we are. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really important diagnostic. It's an incredibly important diagnostic and incredibly dangerous readout. Uh, as you said, that we'd publish soon. I was speaking recently to an expert on the Amazon uh, who, quite sober in, in the morning, said in his judgment that there is a one in 10 chance that the uh, Amazon will not hit its tipping point and become savanna. Uh, that obviously has enormous implications for um, the rest of the global system because it is such a critical piece. There's been recent publicity similarly to the, the Congo River Basin uh, is also moving in all the wrong directions really quite fast, um, which is to say that those boundaries, that boundary headline that we're in, we're in the red zone um, is 
is both at a, at, at a global level, but at the, at, a, the, at the precise pressure points as well, like the Congo, like the Amazon. The, the obvious question, again, we have to go back to politics, um, I think. Very few countries have been willing to put to their citizens the question, do you want to do do you want to change? Do you want to make really fundamental change to cope with this? Denmark is one that has, uh, and indeed the current Danish government is is was elected on a climate uh, mandate, uh, and in fact the citizens uh, demanded a more of a climate mandate than the politicians initially were offering in terms of the rate of change, etc. Uh, the bad news is that Denmark, although perhaps a pilot fish, is 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 a small pilot fish, and we've got the problems of the big pieces of the system the United States, more generally North America, uh, the EU, uh, China, India, Indonesia, et cetera. Um, Johan, this is, I guess, almost by definition, a pessimistic conversation. Um, it's a tough world. There's tough choices to be made. I think the optimism you just injected that you believe citizens in Europe, in the Americas, in many countries get it. Their leaders don't, but they get it. And perhaps that's the challenge. Um, how do the scientists, how do other concerned citizens get the leaders to listen to what their citizens are demanding? How do we go, if it's code red, and that is what you've been saying, how do we get the leaders to understand that the people want action? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a really difficult question. And of course, to that question, I think one also has to add the element of urgency, because one thing we've learned over the past 50 years, and, and, and not least during the whole, uh, you know, fantastic Telberg journey is that, you know, investing only in building awareness and building bottom up processes will not will not be enough. Uh, we don't have time to wait for uh, uprisings around the world. I mean, it's fantastic to see uh, the Fridays for Future movement. It's fantastic to see uh, the engagement of business leaders, not least around the world. And and you know we have many, many, many islands of of, uh, of of initiative and success. But still, I'm of the view that that this this uh, mismatch between the majority of citizens willing to uh, to step up and and act on on climate change and the political leaders inability to act on that requires more direct policy engagement meaning that that can be from from citizens definitely but it certainly has to be science business and citizens together um, having much more strategic direct influence on on uh, heads of state i mean heads of state Minister for Finance, I mean, a mistake we've been doing is that we've been engaging with the ministers for the environment on this issue for, for decades. That's a big mistake because the climate crisis has nothing to do about the environment. It has to do with security, with stability, with jobs, with the economy, with competitiveness, with health. So so now is the time, I think, to, to go much more straight into the to the to the prime minister's offices around the world and uh, and do what we attempted to do you remember in Copenhagen in 2009 at, at COP15 where uh, you know you had uh, the heads of state i mean you had Angela Merkel and you had Barack Obama you had uh, the big leaders trying to 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 solve this problem and they failed but 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 now we've fallen back unfortunately and placed the whole climate crisis the whole planetary boundary crisis too far away from from the real powers i mean the real powers within the powers meaning uh, Xi Jinping, uh, President Biden, uh, uh, you know, you have to have Olaf Scholz, you have to have Boris Johnson, and so on. So I think that that's something that I'd like to see much more of a, of a, you know, serious, tough discussions on how do you get a price on carbon in place that does not only focus on the European market, but really goes beyond the European market. How do you start putting end dates on the combustion engine? I mean, really tough end dates. I mean, 2030, stopping all construction of new combustion engines in the world, having the World Trade Organization to, to really put strong 
carbon measures for all trade. I mean, you know, start really being serious. The financial institutions, IMF needs to go in with some hard policies on, on halting all forms of support for infrastructure that has anything to do along their entire value chain with fossil fuel infrastructure. I mean, we're talking... That's the only thing that matches the science today. And, uh, and I think it, it requires an interplay between political leaders and science and, and business and stakeholders in, in a much more, let's say, hierarchical way. I mean, not, not just believe we push everything on the shoulders on a few engaged citizens, uh, which is, of course, great that, they, uh, that that continues, but it's not, it, won't, it won't solve, the, we won't transform on, on, on our own in that way. Well, the, to underline, it takes leadership. There are no longer any excuses. Uh, the science has been clear for decades. It is crystal clear uh, today. And absent leadership, um, we will see COP 27, 28, 29, 30, and we'll be in a deeper hole rather than on, on the way out. So thank you, Johan, very much for this conversation. Uh, I, I'm, I'm incredibly pleased and proud that I was around at the beginning of some of your, your planetary boundaries work. And, and it's wonderful to have seen it mature. And now we need to get people to listen. Now, that's not true. We need to get people to act. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, great, great, to, great to be with you and, uh, and reconnecting. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcast and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation.